Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Edinburgh Book Festival. Uh, my name is Daniel Hahn, and I'm delighted to have been asked to chair this afternoon's conversation. Uh, I feel I ought to say that the event I did this morning was in the children's program, and at one point I had to wear a mermaid's wig, so I feel like this is already an improvement. Um, <laughs> The, these things may yet happen in this event. You never know quite what's going to happen, but I'm hoping that won't be a part of it. Um, we're going to talk like grown-ups. We're going to have a proper grown-up conversation, um, which I'm sure is going to be fascinating. Um, we are going to talk about uh, a subject which I'll introduce to you in just a moment, but we will, of course, leave plenty of time for you to join the conversation and ask some questions towards the end. So do, uh, while you hear Sasha and Elif talking, do think about this, because it'll be great to have you as part of our conversation. Um, and we're talking uh, about language. These two very fine writers uh, do very different work, but one of the things that they have in common is they're both writers in English, and they're both writers in English for whom English wasn't the, the language in which they began. So we're going to be talking about, uh, I suppose, what the languages mean to them, what the transition between languages meant to them. Um, and I suppose what it feels like to write in a language which is the language uh, which was not the language you began in. I also feel, and I don't know whether this is true, but it feels to me that this is the kind of conversation that is the questions I'm going to ask are the kind of questions you would ask more in the English-speaking world than anywhere else. Not least because most of us are entirely baffled by the very possibility of what the two of you are doing. Even I think those of us who have more than one language. Uh, I'm a translator and I have other languages, and yet the, the very idea that one might feel comfortable uh, expressing oneself, that one might be comfortable living in a language to the extent to which you both do, uh, seems extraordinary to me, and I'm going to, to uh, explore that with you in the next hour or so. Just very quick introductions before we make a start. Um, Alexander Hemon, at the far end of the stage, is a Bosnian-American novelist, columnist, uh, short story writer. He's been living in the US for more than 20 years now. Uh, his many awards include a MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, and he is here at the festival party talking about his brilliant new book, uh, The Making of Zombie Wars, which I hope some of you heard him yesterday discussing with Alan Little. Um, this is also a book which he will be signing, I hope, at the end of the event. Um, so I hope if you haven't already had a chance to get such to sign this book, I hope you will do. To my immediate left is Elif Shafak, who is a Turkish novelist, the author of nine novels, whose uh, work has been shortlisted for the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize. This is a work translated into English from Turkish. It's been nominated for the uh, Impact Dublin Award. And she is here with her ninth novel, which she'll be discussing tomorrow, I believe, uh, which is called The Architect's Apprentice. I want to start by asking you both uh, the same question, just as a sort of way into this conversation, uh, which is, I mentioned introducing you that you both began in a language which, which was not English, um, but English is your not exclusive but primary writing language now. Um, and I wonder if you could just describe the transition, describe the moment. Sasha, I'll ask you that first. If you can describe the, the moment of becoming a writer in that language, having been a, a speaker of the previous language? Well, the mo moment lasts for a, a long time, uh, for at least three years. I, I um, arrived to the United States in 92 and was supposed to go back uh, after a couple of months. Uh, but then the war in Bosnia started. Uh, and I had arrived as a young journalist, as someone who had written and published in uh, my native language, which was then referred to as Serbo-Croatian. It was the official language of much of Yugoslavia. Um, and so, um, and I published some fiction and even some poetry in that language. I was a writer. Um, when I came to the United States and found myself in Chicago and decided to stay when the war started, I had to make a decision um, whether I would write in Bosnian or English. It seemed to me, on the one hand, that English would be the language of my life in the United States because it was clear that I would stay there for a long time, possibly for the rest of my life. And also, it became clear to me that I, I was cut off from my native language in that, in as much as a language is defined by the experience of people who speak it, my experience was entirely different from people under siege or being um, subject to genocide. Uh, and so I, early on, my friends who I worked with as a journalist, uh, they would call me in Chicago over a satellite phone, I would dictate. <clears throat> I dictated a couple of texts for them. 
magazine I used to work for at some point, and they wanted me to be a correspondent, as they were. But I could not, in good conscience, um, do that because I kept thinking, what can I tell them? What? How do you talk about you know the, a new movie in American cinemas to people who are under siege? And I said, I, I can't do that. And so for a few years, I stopped writing in, in, in Bosnian, uh, and I was not able to write in English at all. I decided to enable myself to write in English, and uh, for that, I, I read a lot. I gave myself an arbitrary goal of five years of writing a, a publishable story in English, and for some reason, mainly uh, mental decomposure, I wrote a story and, and, um, that was published. It's in my first book after three years. Um, and in that time, what happened, and I understood this in retrospect, was that the English language somehow entered my subconscious mind. I think this is necessary and essential for writing uh, the kind of stuff that we write. Um, it has to be part of subconscious mind. And it, I, in other words, I should not be translating while writing. It's too difficult and too slow. Um, and it entered my subconscious mind, I'm convinced, because the mind was weakened um, and it dropped its resistance. And uh, as part of it, you know, um, was um, the lack of, or the important part of it, aspect of it was the lack of access or um, my feeling of the lack of access to my native language. So I read a lot, and I read in English, obviously, and then underlined words that I didn't know, I looked them up in a dictionary, then, then looked them up time and time again because I could not remember them. Uh, and after three years, I wrote this story in English, and then kept writing in English. And then soon, there, soon thereafter, I uh, started writing in Bosnian again. And so I've been writing, this was in 95, 96. I've been writing in both of the languages since. You used the words decide and decision quite early on then. I'm curious to know to what extent, looking back now, it feels inevitable. Um, well, it seemed necessary, so to that extent it was um, inevitable. Um, it, the, the only option, really, in retrospect, was not to write at all. Um, I could have, which happens to many immigrants um, and refugees, is the, I could have switched my career and, you know, learn the software um, programming skill and then do that, or just be a a thug <laughs> and a criminal. There was that option too. That my size allows that. Uh, but I, get a I chose a different way. Yes, yeah. So uh, now I can only be a crime boss, no longer an enforcer. <laughs> if there are any jobs, I'm willing to consider. Eyes on the prize. Yes. Uh, Ellie, what about you? What was your? Was there a, a moment for you? Or was the transition sort of a, a, a gradual thing for you too? I was intrigued you used the word decision and I'm not sure it was a decision or a conscious decision mm. or a rational decision on my part. It was more like an animal instinct. Um, when I look behind, that's, that's what I see. Um, English for me was, is, a, is an acquired language. I did not grow up bilingual and I can compare myself with my kids who are bilingual. Um, whereas for me, I started learning at the age 10 um, so it was Turkish first, and then it was Spanish, and then English was my third language at the time. But somehow it never abandoned me. You know, I, I was writing poems in English, but always keeping them to myself. My earlier novels have all been published in Turkey first and written in Turkish first. But there came a point when I wanted to get out of Istanbul. It was like, you know... Um, like an, almost an existential need to put some distance, maybe a self-imposed exile. And I think clinging to the English language at that point was not coincidental. So I was in Boston, then I moved to different you know, parts of the States. I lived in America for about five years, came back to Istanbul, and then came to London. But before that also, my childhood was always on and off. I was born in France. You know, there was a time in Madrid, there was a time in Jordan, Amman, back to Turkey. So I've always felt like a nomad, always like a commuter, always like an insider-outsider in Turkey. Mm. I do feel attached to the Turkish language very much, but at the same time I want to put some distance, some intellectual distance, because it's so heavy. It comes with an identity, with a baggage, an historical baggage, a cultural baggage. So I realize when I'm writing in English, even though it's daunting, even though it's intimidating, you know, you're so scared as a foreigner, as a latecomer, because of this gap between the mind and the, and the tongue. 
your mind always runs faster and mm -hmm. your tongue wants to catch up, you know. As foreigners, we want to say, always say more, you know, crack better jokes. And we're very much aware of that, of that gap. But that gap, I think, as intimidating as it is, it can be very stimulating at the same time because it pushes you to pay more attention to nuances, those words that can't be translated from one language to the next. And then you start thinking, why is that? You start thinking about the culture surrounding the language. And also, when I write in Turkish, and I do still write in Turkish, I've never abandoned it in that sense, um, but my readers would recognize this. I use lots of old words and new words. And this is a big question in Turkey. It is a political question in Turkey because we have diminished our, our, our dictionary. We have, in my opinion, it was a, like a linguistic cleansing. You know, you, you get rid of words coming from Arabic, from, from Persian, and Turkify the language. And this is something I've been very critical of over the years. So when you write in English, I like it. I, I like the ability um, when I can say kismet, and when I can say, when I can say chutzpah, and nobody's saying, well, wait a minute, that's an Arabic word, that's a Jewish word. It's okay, it's open, it's fluid. I loved, I fell in love with the vocabulary first and foremost. But I think it's just that distance that I, that I needed, and also the commute back and forth from English to Turkish and, and vice versa. It's the distance from Turkish and also the distance from the language you're writing in now which is a, diff a different kind of gap you described. The thing about vocabulary is also quite interesting because I think there's also an element of not just English has all of this, you know, it's a very porous language, one of the things that makes it an exciting language to work with, but also the fact of coming to it a little later will make you aware of things. Mm -hmm. There is a, a wonderful translator from German called Anthea Bell. She translates German writers, and she says that she always knows uh, when she's translating a, a writer who came to German late because they have much wider vocabularies, because they kind of revel in this, in all these exciting words they have. I wonder, Sasha, whether you have a sense of that, whether one of the, whether you have a sense, I suppose, of the benefits of working with a language that wasn't the language you, you grew up in. Well, the benefit of English is, is much larger, and more people um, speak it and write in it. It has a long history of, of um, publishing, you know, um, and so you can, uh, there are no, even Serbo Croatia was created for the purposes of Yugoslavia, but in individual languages that are come under this umbrella or used to come, you know, Bosnian, Serbian, Turkish, and uh, not Turkish, um, uh, Croatian, sorry. Turkish is part of Bosnian. I mean, there are so many Turkish words in Bosnian. Um, and so on. They don't have a long history of, of publication, or publishing, rather. In the 19th century, there were all these nationalist movements. There was the beginning of, um, you know, sustained uh, cultural life in print, but that had its own um, nationalist overtones. It's not something easy. Uh, to relate to. Um, so that I think if obviously it's better to know two languages than one, particularly if one of them is this vast uh, English language. Um, but at the same time, every language is, um, is, a, is a compound creation. There are no pure languages. It's entirely a fascist fantasy to purify the language from all these other um, words, all these other influences. It's insane, and it's enti entirely tantamount to, you know, closing the border so people could not come in. No matter how much you work at uh, closing the borders, they will come in, and with that they will bring in, um, you know, all of, all of the baggage that they carry, including their language. And in the olden days of vast empires, where there were many populations, many languages living simultaneously, they would move within borders. Part of my ability with language, I'm sure it's related to the fact that on my father's side, uh, it's a Ukrainian-speaking family. And not only Ukrainian-speaking family, they moved to Bosnia about 100 years ago. Um, but they were from the part of what is now Ukraine, but it was then uh, the easternmost province of the Austrian Empire, Galicia, now it's western Ukraine, which had a, a number of populations speaking various languages. So that my grandmother's parents, her father was Polish and her mother was Ukrainian, and they spoke Polish and Ukrainian in the same family. And they identified themselves. I, I remember a picture my grandmother showed me uh, of her family. Her brothers had those Polish uniforms with, you know, rhomboid hats, and her sisters had Ukrainian dresses. It was not um, unheard of or strange to have Poles and Ukrainians belonging to being brothers and sisters. And now it's unthinkable because the language has been purified, national identification has been established as unimpeachable, and so on. And so this history of this of Europe, for sure, but of the world, could be entirely um, retold uh, as a history of migrations and influences and languages overlapping and people carrying 
and uh, uh, their cultures into a different space and transforming it and so on. This whole narrative of nations of being the same throughout history uh, and staying the same because they protect themselves from all these migrants and, and contamination of other people and their languages and culture. It, I mean, I deplore it beyond words. And it's constantly, um, I mean, it's happening right now. There's yeah. a whole anti-migrant narrative. It's yeah. that swarms of, what is it Cameron said, swarms of migrants. Mm -hmm. They don't have language or bodies or identities. They come in swarms and they will come. Mm. As someone who, as people, both of you, who uh, have this, this choice, or at least this possibility of, of telling stories in these two different ways, using these two different kinds of expression. I'm interested in what you both feel you can do differently in the two, in your two options, if you like. Um, you mentioned, Sasha, for example, there's a big audience, the big audience is in English. But I'm curious to know whether you feel like you have, as it were, different capacities in these different languages, whether there are things that which aren't, I don't just mean because Turkish has great, you know, this kind of word, and I'm, I'm never quite convinced by people who say so-and-so is a really good language for emotion and such-and-such such is a really good practical yeah. language, but I'm curious to know how you feel yourselves, whether these feel like two slightly different capacities. I think they, they are different. I mean, each and every language has its own melody, its own labyrinth, and languages shape us. You know, it's not the other way around. We, we enter into new world, very completely different worlds, and even our body language changes as you move from one language to the next, or our intonation changes. I listen to my voice, my voice sounds different to my ears in Turkish than, you know, in, in English. For me, what, you know, maybe encouraged me was this, you can, if you can dream in more than one language, and we do dream in more than one language, because the mind knows no such boundaries, you know, you can start a dream in English, finish it in German, you know, it is possible. So it is possible to write fiction, you know, in two languages. I never translate myself, I, I can't do that because I think, and I don't translate in my head either, when I'm writing in English I just delve into that water, whether I sink or swim, that's where I have to be. But then when the book is done, when it's over, it's translated by a professional translator and then I take the Turkish translation and I rewrite it, you know, with my own rhythm. Um, so th that's, that's the way I do it. But one of the things that I realized I was able to do in English, to be honest, was to swear. You know, you can swear in English. And for many women, especially coming from, you know, certain parts of the world, and I observe Turkish women a lot, middle class, upper class women who have been, you know, brought up in a certain way, who can never say anything indecent in Turkish. But they are, you know, using the F word so liberally, you know, in, when they're speaking English, because you don't carry that, you know, guilt somehow you're a different person and it's not as heavy. When I wrote um, The Bastard of Istanbul, I realized had I written that novel in Turkish, it would have been a different book. Writing it in English gave me maybe, I don't know, maybe more courage, something else, some, uh, some additional zone of existence. And even the word bastard in Turkish, it sounds so heavy, you know, I might not have been able to use it. But because it was, I said it in English first, then I could say it in Turkish and I could say pitch. Had I done it in Turkish first, it would be so heavy on my tongue. Also, what we're talking about, I suppose we talk about language sometimes as though you're going to express whatever you express, and the language is somehow just an arbitrary medium for it. And actually what you're talking about is having a sort of different relationship with what each language allows you to do. You said, that you said something about guilt, and you made a gesture as though it were a physical thing just then. Yeah. Um, as though you... <clears throat> excuse me. As though you sort of inhabit languages slightly differently. I wonder, I mean, Sasha, is that the same for you? Do you feel that the language is not merely a medium for saying whatever you're going to say anyway, or whether that somehow determines what it is you can express? Well, I think the notion of expression is slightly problematic because, you know, um, um, one of the uh, nationalist um, axioms is that somehow you can only express yourself in your own language, and beyond that you are... Um, what you feel, and what you feel is never just yours, it also belongs to the nation. It is, it is not expressible, so that um, you, we have to, and this is where all this discourse of protecting language, we have to protect the language from influence so we could be able to express, so we would be able to express ourselves in the language. But I prefer to think of, of course, there's an aspect of expression in, in, in language. But in terms of writing, I, I like to think of um, 
writing as, as well is building something. And I have these elements, this pile of elements when it, that I have, you know, in English, and I have this pile of elements in, when, it, when it's in Bosnian. So I'll do certain things with English that I can't quite do with, with Bosnian, or I'll do certain things in Bosnian that I can't do in English. But I can also combine those things, or I can see how they could fit into these things. And to me, the most interesting aspect of my bilingual life is the overlapping space, as it were, not overlapping words or syntactic um, combinations or, you know, changing um, the syntax so it sounds more Bosnian or more uh, English, but rather to find ways to convey what is presumably inexpressible in the other language. And I'm fully aware, and this is ex actually exciting to me, um, I think poetry, the, Robert Frost, I said this yesterday, uh, excuse me for repeating myself, but I live by this, Robert Frost said, um, poetry is what is lost in translation, and that is true to an extent, of course. But Joseph Brodsky, and he would know a thing or two about that, he said poetry is what is gained in translation. It is precisely in looking for the equivalent of a word that is, by national standards, untranslatable in some other language, that, you know, poetry, the possibilities of poetry open up. And so, you know, I, in some ways I build my own elements in English when I try to find a way to do what I do in Bosnian in it, and, and vice versa, too. So the languages reinforce each other. They're not segregated and separated. I do, I mean, I, may, I think in English when I write English, I think in Bosnian when I write in Bosnian. Most of the time I don't think at all. And, and I am capable of conducting simultaneous conversations in Bosnian and English. My wife doesn't speak Bosnian. I talk to her. Then I turn to my mother and speak to her in, in Bosnian. But this combination of languages, right? The, the overlapping space is, is what is interesting to me. And, and because this is the transformative space. This is where the new language is emerging. This is where we move away from the standardized language, from the oppression of those who want it pure and so on. Mm. I remember uh, someone asking Ahtaf Sarif, the Egyptian novelist, if she was more comfortable speaking English or speaking Arabic. And she said, I'm most comfortable when I can use both mm. in an environment where you have people who have both. And then you have twice as much, as it were, right. uh, possibility for kinds of saying things. At least twice as much. At least yeah. twice as much. I mean, I wonder whether that, that is kind of the, the ideal notional audience, readership, is the readership who could get whichever, I mean, wh whichever language you write in, and you could simply move in a slightly, what was now seems slightly alarming fashion, um, between languages in the middle of sentence, as you do when you're at home. Well, I think, for me, it's essential, because um, there, are about, there were about four million Bosnians before the war, about one million are in diaspora right now. And many of them, most of them speaking at least two languages with various degrees of success. So bilingualism, biculturalism, or life of, uh, in bilingual context is essential to being Bosnian. Even people who are still in Bosnia, they have family, they have you know, cousins coming over, and many of them speak English because there were so many foreigners that have passed through Sarajevo and Bosnia, whether they were NGOs or foreign troops and so on. So, it is um, very difficult now to reduce Bosnia and its culture to just one language. There's always this, some other language, the, at least the possibility of some other language looming on the horizon. And so my audience um, are ideally are bilingual people. Uh, this, this is in both languages. I, what I write in Bosnia, I publish online, and so you know, people from all over the world have access to it. And so um, they might be speaking English and Bosnia in their daily life, just like I do, or Norwegian. And Boston, or Norwegian English in Boston, and so um, it's for my my perfect audience is bilingual in that sense, in any language. Talking about Turkish, and if you were saying that it was it went through this kind of artificial purification process in the last century, I wonder what the reaction is uh, in Turkey to. A, a, a Turkish writer who can write in Turkish, but who is choosing to do this other, this strange other thing. It's not nice, <laughs> not not positive at all. And in that regard, you know, Turkey is slightly different than Bosnia because um, people are not bilingual, and uh, the perception, if you're writing in English, English being the language of colonialism, even though Turkey was never colonized, there is this anti, not anti-Western sentiment, but a weird. Reaction, you know, if I were writing in Chinese or Russian or in Arabic, in addition to Turkish, that reaction wouldn't be there. But because you're writing in English, there's something additional, some additional reaction that comes from from people. And and I so much agree with what you said. You know, this 
19th century understanding of nationalism, if you're a Turkish writer, you know, a writer is defined primarily by his or her language. I do have enormous respect for people like Mahmoud Darvish, you know, who said, my language is my homeland. I do understand what they're saying. I do know Kurdish writers and poets for whom language is primarily, you know, the primary source of their identity. I respect that. But I also know that's not the only path. There are other ways of existence for writers, you know, and I my path is different. For me to be bilingual, multilingual, to dream in more than one language, to write in more than one language, this is what keeps me going. And where I feel most comfortable is storyland, you know? That's, that's where I feel more, more comfortable. But it's very difficult to explain this to people because for them it's a national pride, it's a matter of betrayal, you know, if you're writing in English. I have been accused a lot by particularly nationalist cir circles. Even today, I mean, if I tweet, and I do tweet in English and Turkish, I write the same thing in Turkish and English. So if I write, let's say, something about domestic violence in Turkey or anything that's not good in Turkey, I write it in, in Turkish. People are somehow okay with that even though some are not. But then I write the same thing, the same thing in English. And then there's a huge reaction. They're saying, why are you telling it to them? Them being the Westerners. As if we are a house, we live in a house, we can just close the door, you know, draw the curtains, and then they won't see what's happening inside the house. They still use this 19th century old, it's outdated idea of nation state, which is not feasible anymore. It's not, you know, that's not what's happening in this globalized world. Information is constantly fluid, knowledge is fluid. They don't see it that way. So if you open the curtain, and tell them what's happening inside the house, and you do this in English, then that's a betrayal. Then you're a traitor. Yeah. So the reaction can be very, very negative. I mean, I wonder whether there is, a, I suppose there probably isn't an answer to this, but whether there is some legitimate concern, which is not to do with betrayal, but there's a question about whether there are things you can do to make appropriating English as a writing language and do interesting things with it and make it porous and, and uh, as it were, colonize it back, rather than be a part of what does exist, which is a sort of global surrender to this impossibly powerful language. I mean, I think that the, the, the question of the power of the relations between languages is, is a serious one, um, and English is this kind of omnivorous thing. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, Sasha, whether you have any thoughts about this, whether... whether you can somehow be empowered by using English rather than saying, we, I think we should all write in English right. because that's where the readers are. I do have thoughts on that. It's my thinking day, I think, on Sundays. Uh, <laughs> um, the only book him on Sundays for these right. events. You know, once yesterday week, was a disaster, uh, the whole event. <laughs> <laughs> when I was writing in, um, started writing in English and uh, I was with my, um, married then to a different person and she would read my stories and she was a native-born American, and um, also goes way back to uh, the Pilgrims and the Mayflower, and all that, and, uh, and the Puritans, most importantly. But in any case, she and she, she was is a fine human being. But she would read uh, my stuff, and she would say, "We don't say that," and I would say, "Now we do." <laughs> And I never, I mean, it's partly, I guess, my um, arrogance, but I never thought I had to ask anyone for a permission to do or say things. The empowering thing is, if it is, that I was always aware that I'm changing the language by my presence in it. Now, I'm not the only one, obviously, and it's a collective effort, not only in parts of, on part of all the people who come into the English language late, but even people who were born into English. That's what literature does. It changes the language rather than merely reproducing it. What narration does is finds new uses for old words, uh, in, not to mention poetry. So to me, the empowering thing is that, and you know, in this whole um, constellation of issues related to migration and identity transformation, all this, um, my position in English is, is transformative. And so I want everyone who came to uh, English from elsewhere to write. I mean, this sort of solidarity in that mm -hmm. act. I want to change it. I do not want David Cameron, let alone Donald Trump, uh, <laughs> to own the English language. Right? I will take it away from them so they can speak some kind of pigeon moronic language that they understand, understand easily. But I'm going to take that language away from them. I have no shame about it. I will never ask them for permission. And so this is my line of... Of, of struggle. This is my agency in that society and in that, in that culture. And so um, I don't know if I'm powerful before that, I mean, because of that, but that's, this is how I practice my agency. 
And I wonder whether translation is also part of this. You both mentioned translation when you were talking earlier, and whether one of the things that translating books from other languages into a language, one of the things that can do is stretch a little bit what that language itself can do. I mean, I wonder, does, is that happening with, with Turkish now? Is, is there is what we hope happens with English, which is the more you translate, the more flexible English becomes. Is that happening the other way with Turkish? Is it, is it beginning to... Stretch. Stretch. You know, it's, it's, it's a one-way street in a way because when I look at the books published in Turkey, around 43% of them are, are translated from other languages and mostly Western languages, European languages, mostly English and, and French. Of course, here it's, you know, one or two percent in the English-speaking world and most of them, again, from the Spanish language, you know, translated. So, in other words, Turks read European literature more than Europeans read Turkish literature. Um, the, the, that's a very important, you know, part of it was a very important part of our identity as we were growing up, you know, reading Balzac and, and reading Charles Dickens and, you know, all, all, the, all the translations. Necip Mahfuz was translated into Turkish only recently because Turks thought, you know, they had nothing to do with the Middle East, that they had not much in common, so there's, they didn't know much about, we still don't know much about Persian literature, Arabic literature, but we knew more about European literature. And I think that's part of the reason why many people got so emotional. They were like, okay, we thought we were Europeans, but Europe doesn't want us, so we don't want them any anyhow. There's this emotional tit for tat, almost childish going on uh, in Turkey. I, 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 I wish I could say to you that it's encouraged right now, you know, to be bilingual or to stretch the imagination, but what I'm seeing is the exact opposite. I see, you know, nationalism making a comeback. It's coming back in a very strong way. Uh, obviously, you know, religious fundamentalism or conservatism is part of it because you see, you think you're an isolated nation. Turkey is not an island, but it behaves like an island. It thinks it's an island. We like to think we're, we're you know, surrounded by waters on three sides and enemies by four, on four sides. So with that mentality, you don't really want to take too many things from outside. <laughs> Nationalism, the way I see it, or this isolationism is, is you know, part of the part of the problem, and I agree with what you said. You know, we, they always say so much is lost in translation, so much is gained in translation. People learn so much from translation. It's a pity if Europe that makes the same mistakes that we have done in Turkey. You know, by losing our cosmopolitan heritage, I think our loss has been enormous. And I am worried that Europe is now making the same mistake, seeing cosmopolitanism, the word, you know, multiculturalism, whether we like it or not, we have not been able to replace it with anything better yet, you know. As a reaction to that, that kind of isolationism, that exclusivist mentality is on the rise in Europe. And everything is connected, you know, how you approach language, how you approach literature, how you approach identity, these are all connected issues. And I wouldn't want Europe to make the same mistakes that we have done in Turkey. And in the US, precisely 50% of the population have this problem. Yes. <laughs> uh, do, do, you, I mean, do you recognize this, this description? Is it, no, absolutely, there is this absolutely. Of, like, but, um, no, um, but they, they cannot, it cannot be enforced in, in so many ways. And people are already there. For one thing, there's a, you know, they, these idiots, um, they use a term like anchor baby. They imagine immigrants come um, to the United States illegally, and then they have a baby, and by virtue of being born on the territory of the United mm -hmm. States, it becomes a citizen that everyone can come in. But there is an anchor population you will never get rid of, and there, no, of course they never should, of, uh, of a Latino population. So we're talking about millions of people. I mean, um, and they will keep coming because of the nature of the world, because of the nature of the border, because of the nature of, of capitalist economy. Um, and so it'll never, it's complete fantasy. Then. Perhaps an island like that, uh, you know, this island can enforce its borders in a way, but land borders cannot be blocked unless you build walls and, and, and you know, barbed wire. Which, which is exactly which is, which what, is what the, the front runner for the Republican right. nomination is threatening to but do. They, they cannot, they cannot, this is, it is a complete fantasy. They, what that does, it imperils people crossing the border, creates this hatred that, you know, justifies um, uh, murder and killing and exploitation and all this. But e even, I mean, even if they were elected, that, 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 it's, that would be very difficult to pull off. It is not unimaginable, obviously, because it's, for one thing, it's too late. Um, there are too many people in the United States who would not allow that. It will not happen without vast resistance. Um, and so the worst case scenario is conflict. Not that they would win, but it will 
um, reach the point, it has already reached a point of conflict, maybe even greater, you know, uh, uh, violence. But of course, nationalists mm-hmm. thrive on this sure. because the whole point of that hateful discourse is to create a sense of uh, being besieged. And now we have we who can identify ourselves in those simple terms of monolingual, monocultural, monoracial, and all this. We should all get together and protect ourselves from all these foreigners banging at our doors. And this this in the United States, as here, I suspect, or anywhere else, is really a, a class thing be, behind it, or at least class plays an important role. You know, Trump is and protects the wealth of those like him, primarily, and then those who are willing to follow him. I mean, if he were to become a president, which is hard to imagine. Uh, but this rhetoric of, of being besieged by foreigners and, you know, creates otherness in a particular a particular mode, which is dangerous and, and exploitative and, well, and, and murderous in many cases. And same, the same thing is, is happening here. Um, and this solidarity of, of hatred, you know, it, it, it is a political platform. And this is why he has high numbers in polls, which might wither away, eventually perhaps or at least be uh, lowered. But it, it creates this excitement of being under siege. Is it your job as writers to apart from whatever you, you think your principle, you know, you are tellers of stories and, what, and however you want to use that. But to be champions of pluralism, champions of a plural idea, is that part of what you do this for? Because that's a, that seems to be the antidote to what you're describing. I, I cherish this question. I, I care about it a lot because I'm a bit torn. You know, on the one hand, I, I don't think writers should have a mission or try to teach something. I really don't like that. And I don't like this supposed hierarchy between the reader and, you know, the writer as if the writer knows less and then the reader, I'm sorry, as if the writer knows more and can teach something. You know, I don't think of it that way at all. And also coming from Turkey, we have this tradition that goes all the way back to the late Ottoman era of father novelists. Uh, the novel as a genre came to Turkey from Europe. It was the youngest genre because poetry is so old. It goes, you know, back centuries old. But the novel is very, very, you know, young. And it was, when it came, it was, in a way, a terrain where people could discuss notions of identity, belonging, how much to westernize, where to stop, um, you know, how to be a good Turk, where does East start, where does West end, you know, all these questions was part of it. So the early novelists were all, almost all of them were male intellectuals who saw themselves as the fathers of their readers, who thought they had a mission to teach their readers something. And I don't feel close to that tradition at all. I write with my intuition. I am a bit drunk when I'm writing. I don't know what's going to happen, you know, six pages on. I don't know what that character is going to do. I like it when the story surprises me. So how can I try to teach something? Yet at the same time, of course, I am there. And the things that disturb me, you know, starting from sexual taboos to all these national taboos, ethnic taboos, you know, I do like to question. To me, I think the way I can answer is, Questions matter more than answers. I want to be able to ask questions and leave the answers to the readers, but the questions must be asked, especially when there are silences, when, you know, things are suppressed under the, or swept under the carpet, then I would like to show them, you know, I would like to probe them a little bit. But to say that this is the right answer, this is the, you know, right way of reading history, I don't think a writer should do that. It's the questions that we must provoke. Uh, um, I think, I mean, I agree. I think there are two, at least two, uh, competing concepts of literature. One of them is this hierarchical nationalist um, concept where, you know, we, it's a space, and not just literature, but culture, where we have to establish and then in- enforce and reinforce our identity mm-hmm. and their hierarchies. They're writers because they're close to the language and the soul of the people as a very 19th century. You know, they are more important. They speak for all of us with yeah. certain precision. And so, um, it's a limited field, and this is the field that has to be protected from, from all those others and all those influences in the, in the 19th century and beyond, from women and such weak creatures. Uh, the other concept, which is what I believe in, is uh, literature as a, as a democratic field. It's inherently democratic. Everyone's entitled to telling a story or hearing a story. Everyone exists uh, simultaneously with it, all the writers, uh, even if they disagree politically and otherwise. Um, and all the readers, and so I, I practice my craft in this field. And in this field, um, uh, exclusion is not 
is contrary to the principles that organize this field in hierarchies. There are no right, everyone um, ought to be able to, to participate. And I think this is the agency of literature. It is not establishing important issues at this time and then didactically forcing them upon the reading public, which then must respond for the purposes of moral improvement or national moral improvement, but rather, uh, you know, um, practicing this idea of, of democratic thought that is vaster than a single society, let alone a, a single uh, culture in it. And this is how I, do. I don't feel a need to write about migrants or immigrants right now. I've been doing it, you know, for many years, but I don't do it because I don't think that if I don't do it now, you know, things will get really, really bad because I'm going to stop this, this uh, change, this terrible situation. I will write what I have a need to write about. The way by posing questions, I will try to think about the world in this field, and uh, and what I do will be available to people who are concerned about the same things, and we'll have a conversation in this field within the particular domain of what I've written, perhaps, but then even even beyond that. Uh, and I don't I don't feel a need to you know bring up these issues, otherwise I will be morally and politically suspect. Can I come back on that? I, I, no, I, I fully agree with you know everything you said. The, the, the thing is, when you're coming from countries like Turkey, maybe Nigeria, maybe Pakistan, Egypt, I don't think you have the luxury <clears throat> of being apolitical, you know? Right. We, as writers, we don't have that luxury. On the other hand, I find it very troublesome when writers think of themselves as the representatives of collective identities. You know, how can I rep represent anything larger than myself? I can just be myself and try to understand, you know, every human being is, is a complexity, has so many conflicting, coexisting, you know, voices inside. And I, I try to understand myself. But of course, part of myself is my, you know, Turkish background, maybe Islam, maybe, you know, many other things. It's, it's all part of the story. What I'm trying to say is, I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer that we should not be reduced to our identity, you know, particularly our national identity or our religious background. Yet at the same time, the urgency, you know, as you said, you want to say something because so much is happening and so much that's happening is so bad. You want to say something about it. And it's a big, big question because... I think it was Doris Lessing, you know, who at one point said literature needs distance. You know, it's the analysis after the event. And yet we are in a position to analyze during the event, while the events are happening. You know, we don't have that luxury of waiting maybe 50 years anymore. So much is happening right now. And you want to say something without being reduced to that national identity. So always, you know, shifting grounds. I think we should not let go of the, you know, freedom of imagination. We need that. I should be able to write about, I, I don't know, a Norwegian professor or a Chinese peasant. It doesn't have to be part of my identity as long as I can connect to that story. And yet at the same time, not be apolitical, you know, to keep an eye on what's happening in the world, but not make politics our main guide. So these nuances are very important, I think, for our own you know, sanity. I think well, those two competing notions of literature, I think, that could be understood in terms of uh, one of them being based on national sovereignty, including the cultural sovereignty, and then being based on individual sovereignty. So that um, you know, individual sovereignty entails your national, ethnic, uh, cultural, and any other background, but it's also identity that is layered and, and endless, endlessly so, possibly. It is everything that you might be because of who you are. Uh, and this notion of individual sovereignty can be practiced in literature because the literature that I like to read and write is based on that. That everyone in in the book that I read or, um, and like and and write possesses this at least as an idea of individual so individual sovereignty. They have an agency that is not national, that is not a, an expression of the of a of a collective agency, and that in itself is a political position. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, a, in particularly in, in countries like you know where national sovereignty is a, is a burning issue, including here. Um, but it's also I want to say this that all these political instincts that I have, I don't have to practice as a writer. You know I mean, I can write. I write columns. I mean, I, yes, as a writer, but I write columns which I can express my political opinions very clearly and and very um, directly related to the current events. But also as a citizen, you know, I, I do not stop being a citizen. When I write books, when I'm a writer, there are ways to do this. I have protested against various things, you know, uh, in, in the squares of America, and I will continue to do so. There, there is a, a complexity 
always, though, because while on the one hand, I think probably like both of you, it, I find it hard to think of a writer I admire who comes with answers rather than questions. I think questions are much more interesting for a reader, apart from anything else. At the same time, there are things that, uh, and I don't want to keep going back to the question of power, but as someone who has a lot of readers, as someone who has one and a half million followers on Twitter, whatever it may be, the, the, the possibility of the things that are important to you the questions that are important to you, the concerns you have, actually making people think differently. There is a great potential for, whether this is intentional or not, for the way you write and the language in which you write to have quite a significant impact on the way your readers read. Yeah. In fact, which depending on which language you're tweeting Absolutely. in, I'm yeah. interested that you choose, for example, to tweet everything in both languages. Yeah. Um, Yes, I mean, it, to, to be honest, it was a bit unusual. I mean, in Turkey, we, we don't, you know, our writers, it's, it's a pity, you know, why don't our writers express themselves in two languages? And I'm not talking about English and Turkish. For instance, why not Kurdish and Turkish, you know, Armenian and Turkish, uh, Hebrew and Turkish, you know, so many other combinations that are possible, could have been possible. But when you look at history, again, late 19th century, intellectuals used to express themselves in three languages, four languages, and there were women writers who did that. So I think afterwards, during those hundred years, we, we, we shrunk, in our, our imagination shrunk, you know, because of this nationalistic paranoia that's going on, the fear that you will be contaminated if you touch someone else's language and you need to get rid of that. I mean, imagine a dictionary that shrunk, you know, in, in, in Turkey, like 60%, uh, between 50 and 60% of the vocabulary was eliminated. So that makes a huge difference because the way you think is affected when you lose nuances. I mean, I can say yellow in Turkish, I can say red, but I can't say the shades in between because they used to come from Persian. So I've lost those shades. For me, that's an indication of losing a nuanced way of thinking. It has such a huge impact. We have about 10 minutes left for uh, you to do some work. And there was a hand up very quick. That was very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> have you been waiting for 49 minutes? <laughs> Poised. <laughs> the microphone just coming to you. If you could wait just a moment, please. Thanks a lot. You both inspired me like, hugely today. Uh, I always struggle. How do you can connect if you are so strongly rooted, like your roots are so strong in Turkish, like my roots are so strong in India. So how do you feel connected when you are writing a Chinese character or how you be true to that character because you haven't lived that life? Mm -hmm. What helps you to do transition of that hat of, oh, I'm writing a Chinese professor or something like mm -hmm. that? How mm -hmm. do you connect to... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a problem with this teaching in creative writing courses. You know, the first thing we teach is, you know, write what you know. And I think that's so wrong, you know. That is so wrong. And, and when you and many editors will tell you, I, I think, the same thing. When you look at the novels and stories that are being turned in, you know, sent to for publication, um, etc., so many of them are autobiographical. Because there's nothing wrong with wrong writing autobiographical work. That is precious. I'm not um, by no means, you know, uh, undermining, belittling it. But there are many other ways of producing fiction. There are many other ways of storytelling. So we always tell people, be safe, you know, play it safe. Just just start with your own story, your own identity. And I really think that's wrong. As long as I can feel it, I can connect to it. But there's a trick. For me to be able to connect, I have to do my research. I have to, I have, to have that emotional journey and intellectual cerebral journey. So there's, there's some work that comes with it. But it is possible. It is possible to have multiple identities, and that's why we find fiction so, you know, empowering. Because in our daily lives, we're always reduced to one or single, vo you know, one voice. But we all know that we have multiple voices. I was very much inspired by uh, African American feminist movement, uh, particularly when I was in Boston. And when you read people like Audre Lorde, you know, they say she says, "I'm a mother. I'm black. I'm a feminist. I'm a lesbian. I'm this. I'm that. I'm all these things and more." You know, you can't reduce me to a single identity, and we should refuse that. That's why, yet, yes, I can be, when I'm writing a story, I can be Norwegian, I can be American, I can be Turkish, I can be Kurdish. Why not? Because all of these different existences are part of my existence. We're not that different, in fact. Isn't but it's also, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, 
if we subscribe to this notion that I cannot imagine anyone different than me, then I will end up talking about myself for the rest of my life. Not only that, the whole literature will be this solo voices talking into the void. I mean, the very idea of literature, of culture, is going beyond yourself, expanding yourself imaginatively into the spaces of others. The question is the threshold. That is, we think, well, you know, um, maybe I can write and imagine someone who's similar to me. But what does that mean? Does that mean a man or a woman? If it's a woman, you know, what is the difference between us? Why is reasonable objection? Someone saying, no, you cannot write about uh, a woman because you're not a woman. And then you can push this border or uh, farther uh, closer, you know, to yourself. But if we think that other people's lives are unimaginable, right? That's the end of literature and culture. So I'd rather try to write a Chinese professor and fail then play safely and write about someone who's, who's like me. Most of the time I do write about someone who's like me, but I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but having said this, everyone in my books is some version of me. So, you know, you can never... I, there's not only one person that I can identify with. Um, everyone, including the furniture, everything, yeah, yeah. Is, is me in some ways. Otherwise, it, it's, a, it's a dead project. Uh, it, so you, this you expansion, come back to yourself. Right, yeah. This yeah. expansion into beyond yourself by way of imagination, it's an essential human activity, not just in literature, but everything you do. So when you talk to a person you don't know, you know, beyond the words that Elif says now, I have to imagine her mind, right? Mm-hmm. To understand her, to imagine all these things that she has talked about, that she has signified in her speech. It's a basic... Um, uh, a psychological skill of every human being is called something theory of mind, our ability to imagine that someone else who is not us has a different set of beliefs and ideas and emotions and background, that there's a mind that is unlike my own. And if we, if we cannot imagine that mind, then it's, it's solipsism all the way through. Yeah. But is there not also an assumption of a certain kind of uh, universality? Because in one sense, right, what you know means... Whoever, whichever characters you're writing, you have experienced fear and you have experienced desire and you have experienced anxiety, whatever it is. And so there are ways of inhabiting a character, even if they are a professor from another country, or, mm. so, which allows you to escape from having to write about only Turkish women who live in London or only about Bosnian american writers. I, I don't think that's the, the way the message is being perceived right now or, or conveyed, because many people really... Identify it with 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 their uh, you know identity with where they where they're coming with from the autobiographical with stuff. autobiographical element. Uh, here in the front. Uh, hello. Uh, can you please briefly sorry? Uh, can you please briefly introduce your books and see if you're using tell if you're using the same language in the same book, Elif, or you using the same language when you're doing your column or writing your book. Well, well my, the book I wrote, well, I wrote in English, so it's, in that basic sense, it's a different language, but it's also it's a different set of characters and have different lives, and, you know, um, um, language is endless. Everything, it's what Noam Chomsky called a discrete combinatory system that is, can make an infinite number of combinations from a, uh, a finite number of, of elements, and this is, what liter- this is why literature expands language. So by virtue of writing a column that is a thousand words and it's, you know, anchored in what is happening right now, it requires different language beyond the, you know, the difference in, between English and, and, and Bosnian. But it's all within the, the, the domain in which I operate. Language has registers, and you know, as a writer, as a person, um, as an educated person, I can control those, those registers. So um, they curse more in this book than yes. I curse in my columns, uh, for instance. <laughs> Although I can curse in Bosnian. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> like a motherfucker, as they say. <laughs> For me, the, the two languages are so different. I mean, it's not like from French to English or from Spanish to English. Turkish and English, completely different. The grammar is very, very different. Turkish is based on agglutination like a train. You know, you keep adding syntaxes. Um, the structure is completely different, you know, the inv- inverted sentences. And like you, I would like to think that because of my background, I can bring something into the English language. You know, I can transform this language just like the English language transforms me. So that commute back and forth excites me. But just to give you an example, for instance, one of my earlier novels uh, in Turkish, it's called Iskander, because the name of the male protagonist, it's a, it's a story of an, you know, um, that centers around honor issues, how mother-son relationships, how we raise our sons, like the sultans in the family. It's very, very critical of the gender codes in Turkey. 
So the book was published in Turkey as Iskender because of the character. And then my English publisher said, no, 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 if we publish it, publish it as Iskender, which means Alexander, then people are going to think it's a historical novel. Fair enough. You know, what shall we call it? Honor, because honor is such a central theme in it. All right. When it was published in Italian, my Italian publisher said, no, 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 no. If I call it Honore, people are going to think, you know, it's a book about the mafia. And <laughs> <laughs> so uh, honestly, I can tell you so many examples. That book's title changed so many times as it traveled from one country to another. And that's okay. You know, that's for me, that's, that's fine. As long as the essence is there, the story is there. Actually, I find it very exciting, you know, to see this cultural linguistic differences. Uh, I do not believe in a one-to-one -one translation. If you're not, you know, doing something related to law or translating a historical monument, then in fiction there should be room for freedom, nuances, a little bit of, you know, it has to be fluid. We have time for one last question. I did, I did uh, point to the person in the second row here. I'm sorry, there are a couple of other people. Hi, thanks a lot. Just a quick question, uh, short question on the creative process in two languages. When you go to Storyland, do you go there with a particular language in mind? Or do you ever find yourself starting a story and then realizing, actually, this isn't the right language for this story? Mm. Has that ever happened? Mm, that's such an interesting question. Um, mm. My answer is simple. I write fiction in English, but I don't write it in Bosnian. Um, there's no reason why I shouldn't. I, I just don't. I haven't. Um, so when I write a story, it's... It's in English, um, you know, my columns in Bosnian. And I did write, I wrote a script, which we started write, co-wrote a script. We started writing it in Bosnian and then switched to English at some point. So, I'm, and I, I've always known I could write narrative uh, what, fiction. In, why, in why did you switch? Oh, it was a production issue. The, the, oh, the, the actress we were writing for got a job in London in a musical. And so we, she, my uh, co-writer and the director, Yasmin Lajbanic, she looked for a replacement and could not find anyone um, in, in, in the Balkans, um, so she, she, um, she took um, a French actress, and so we had to rewrite everything for um, that cast. So. I, uh, like you, I write um, columns, you know, uh, non-fiction as well. Those I do in Turkish and, and, and English, but it's been like 12 years now, if not more. I've, st I've been writing all my fiction, first in English, and then it's translated into Turkish, and then I, you know, play with the translation. That's the way I prefer to do it now. It's uh, maybe, you know, there will come a point when I'll feel differently about it, but writing in English, I find it liberating, you know, in, in, a, in a different way. And that's, so I, I this, this is the sea that I, you know, plunge in directly. However, I have realized o over the years, if I'm writing, if, if the story has sorrow in it, if it has sadness, melancholy in it, it's much easier to do that in Turkish. And if there's irony, satire, sarcasm, much, much easier in English. Not because of the linguistic differences, but because of the cultural, you know, uh, yeah, differences, I think. So, so humor, I find it much easier in English. Is that also, I'm allowing myself one last question, even though we've run out of time, but how much of that is also about your own relationship with the languages yes. because one of the things that we know about how we have different relationships with, with different languages is to do with for example who we use those languages with yeah. you uh, Sasha was saying that he speaks English to his wife and Bosnian to his mother so I wonder whether part of that is to do with the fact that you have these different relationships with these languages yes absolutely I mean it's it's not the language the different relationships with the cultures yeah with the nation where you come from uh, Turkey is, is, is a difficult region. I mean, the, the entire region is dif difficult, but Turkey is a difficult country. Uh, just, again, just to give you an example, one of our biggest poets, Nazım Hikmet, in one of his letters, he lived most of his life either in exile or in prison. And there's a letter he wrote from, from exile to his wife who was in Turkey. He says, and he's talking about his country, about Turkey. He says, and he hasn't seen Turkey for many years. He says, my country... I love you so much, I miss you so much, and I'm so angry at you. You know, that anger, um, because things are not moving ahead, because you're drawing circles and circles, if not going backwards very fast. Um, you know, that anger, I think, is very much part of being a Turkish writer. Well, certainly the influences, you have, you know, um, language has emotional content, uh, personal content, but that could also operate within the, within the same language. You know, people who are Native American speakers, I mean, native English speakers who are born in the United States, um, they have a different relationship with their dialect they might come from, and they can switch it 
was endlessly fascinating to me. So people, were, my, my wife's family is from the south, and they, they switch to Yol when they go back home, um, her sister. And she, her sister also lives in, in Chicago. When she comes back to Chicago, she, you know, assumes Chicago accent. So because when she's back um, home, she talks to her family, and this is the language of her childhood. So each language contains registers that can cover that range. So within the same language, there's an emotional dialect, as it were, as opposed to the language that one uses in, in discussions like this. And so the, the register just extends to two, like, or the registers extend to two languages in that regard. So I can speak like a Saeva thug in Bosnian, but I can also, I've learned to speak like a Chicago thug, too. <laughs> but also I can produce some thoughts in both languages, too, on, my, on Sundays. <laughs> which is a very good note on which to end, having a very, very thoughtful conversation. It's such a rich subject, and I'm sorry we have to stop, but there's, uh, we are out of time. I hope this conversation will continue beyond uh, this tent. Um, Elif and Sasha will be signing copies of their books in the bookshop uh, over there. I'm pointing in the right direction, more or less. So do go and talk to them and get your book signed. Um, but before we do that, do please join me in thanking them for such an interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you.